Cool. So this morning we'll be in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 14. And once again, this is our last service for 2023. And the title of the message this morning is Good Plans. Good Plans. So before we get into the study, let me pray once more, and then we'll, we'll look at this uh, together. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this morning. We thank you for the praise and the worship, the fellowship, the donuts, the coffee, just everything, Lord God. The love that's in this room this morning, Lord. And we're just so grateful for this year, 2023, Lord, that you've given to us. And we're looking forward to 2024, Lord, and the various ways that you're going to use us and to bless us, Lord God. And we're so excited. We pray this morning that you fill us once again, fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Lord, please have your hand upon me this morning, that I would say the things you desire me to say, Lord God, that I would decrease and that you would increase, Lord, and that your word would come forth with power and authority as it always does, Lord, that it would pierce hearts, it would change hearts, it would change minds, it would change lives, Lord God. And we just thank you so much for this privilege and this opportunity to come here together to study your word, to share your love, Lord God, and to just fellowship with one another, Lord God, one last time in 2023 before we move into another year. We thank you once again for this beautiful time, Lord. We love you and we praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once again this morning as we gather, we're coming to an end of 2023. I think in a little under 14 hours, it'll be 2024. It'll be a completely new year. And um, this is once again the final sermon of 2023. And every time around this year, I'm reminded of December 31st, 1999, the day before Y2K, the day before January 1st, 2000. Although at that time, I was, I was very young. I think I was in like fifth or fourth grade. But what I remember is that there were many preparations that were taking place in anticipation for January 1st, 2000. Um, people were stocking up on water, they were buying medical supplies, they were stocking up on weapons. I think the only thing we didn't have a shortage of was toilet paper, like we did in 2019. So that might be a big difference there. Um, the thing is, there was a lot of fear, there was a lot of anxiety, there was a lot of uncertainty with that new year that was coming up. It was kind of comical in a sense. And once the clock struck midnight on January 1st of 2000, we recognized that absolutely nothing happened. It was a normal day the next day. And unfortunately for some people, because believe it or not, some people did want the world to end on January 1st of 2000, mostly the introverts, I believe. But putting all joking aside, um, God has good, good plans for us and for his people. And just like Jim said at the beginning, when you reflect and you think back to 2023 and all the seasons that you've been through, the difficulties, the mountaintops and all the in-betweens and the ways the Lord has blessed you. Think about the opportunities you received. Think about the new friends that you made, the new family members that you welcomed into your life, and some of the family members that went home to be with the Lord. You need to understand that the Lord was with you through all of those circumstances in 2023, and nothing is wasted in the Lord, and we have to understand that. Everything was for a purpose and is for a purpose. And I can assure you, as we go into 2024 and the next couple of hours, the Lord is going to be with us as well, because we will face highs and lows and all the in-betweens. And I hope this morning, as we go through this study through the prophet Jeremiah, that this will encourage you, it'll encourage us to take those steps of faith in 2024 to serve the Lord and to live for the Lord, regardless of what's happening um, in our lives, because the Lord has great plans for us. And we're going to see this in the text this morning. So just a little bit of a background here. I'm going to talk just briefly about Jeremiah. So regarding Jeremiah, uh, G. Campbell Morgan once said, Among all the prophets of the Hebrew people, none was more heroic than Jeremiah. And when you think about Jeremiah, he was also known as the weeping prophet. This was a guy who had a 40-year ministry. He didn't have many converts. He was even instructed not to get married. So in the world's eyes, this guy didn't have a very successful ministry. And Jeremiah was also known to be a very sensitive and a retiring person, an individual that was like this. Um, but what's interesting about Jeremiah is that he's one of the Old Testament prophets that really revealed his heart and his character more than any of the others. And I, I find that to be a very beautiful and interesting thing regarding him. But despite all of this, 
he was called to denounce the apostasy of his time that was taking place there. And although he hesitated when God called him, so if you look in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 6, there Jeremiah responding to his call, he says, But I protested, Oh no, Lord God, look, I don't know how to speak, since I am only a youth. And some scholars estimate that he was anywhere from 17 to 20 years of age when he was called into ministry. You know, he had just gotten his driver's license, but the Lord was calling him in to ministry. And I think he's a great example and a great encouragement, especially for our young people, because the Lord can use anyone regardless of um, their age. You just have to be willing and available to be used by the Lord. And ultimately, he surrendered to the Lord and he became one of history's most decisive leaders. And it was all because God had good plans for him and for the people that he was trying to lead. Unfortunately, those that needed his leadership the most, they turned their backs on Jeremiah and therefore turned their backs on the Lord as well. And Jeremiah, he actually began his ministry after the northern kingdom of Israel had fallen to the Assyrians. And that was not too long before the fall of the kingdom or the end of the kingdom of Judah. And it was during a time when there was this power struggle between Egypt, Babylonia, and the Assyrians. And God warned that Judah would fall into Babylonian captivity. And in fact, he revealed this information to Jeremiah. He revealed that because of Judah's sins, that they would be taken captive and held for exile for 70 years by the Babylonians. And Jeremiah's mission was to announce this fact to his fellow countrymen and advise them to submit to Babylonian power. Unfortunately, God's word for Jeremiah at times was kind of a burden for him. I mean, you could imagine the Lord gives you a message for people that are ignoring you, people that are perhaps um, not taking you very seriously and just kind of tuning you out. That could become very, very discouraging. And this is exactly what he faced. Very, very unresponsive people. In fact, he was attacked and he was called a traitor because of what he did for the Lord. And then eventually when Judah was finally taken captive um, by the Babylonians, Jeremiah was one of the few that was left behind there in the homeland while a large percentage of the nation was taken away, if you remember. And the Lord used him to advise these individuals that were left behind not to seek help from Egypt. And of course, they ignored him. They ignored his counsel and actually ended up taking, them, taking him with them to Egypt. And in addition to predicting the Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah also foresaw the destruction of that empire at the end of the 70 years and the return of the Jews to their land. And in today's text, we'll be in chapter um, 29, this will give us some information regarding um, prophecies concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, as well as the Babylonian captivity. Captivity. And today, as we look through this message, through a letter that Jeremiah has written, that God has used Jeremiah to write to the exiles, what we'll see is that the Lord had good plans for his people. And it was a season of chastening and difficulty for them, but the Lord had good plans for them through all of it. <coughs> And I want you to remember this morning as we enter into this new year, the many seasons we're going to face, whether it's a season of chastening, whether it's a season of mourning, whether it's a season of illness or a season of mountaintops, all of those things in our lives are good plans that the Lord has for us as we go through them. And what the Lord desires of us is to surrender our lives to him and to continue to be used by him in the midst of all of those seasons in our life. And I hope this morning the text will encourage you in the ways that it encouraged me, and I hope it encouraged these individuals too. So the first thing we're going to look at, actually we're going to break this down into three sections. Um, in the first section, I'll look at the first three verses, and then we'll talk about this a little bit. What we'll see here is who this letter was directed to. So you, if you look in Jeremiah 29, verses 1 through 3, it says, This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining eld exiled elders, the priests, the prophets, and all the people Nebuchadnezzar had deported from Jerusalem and Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah, the queen mother, the court officials, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, 
the craftsmen and the metalsmiths had left Jerusalem. He sent the letter with Elasa, son of Shaphan, and Jemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. So notice here in these first um, three verses that through Jeremiah, the Lord is writing this letter to these exiles that had been taken captive and taken to, oh, by the Babylonians. And notice here that it's specifically addressed to these leaders, right? These exiled elders of this particular Jewish um, community. Now, one thing to note is that um, King Jeconiah is another form of Jehoiachin. So it's the same individual that we're referring to here in case um, you have questions about that. And then also that term queen mother, the Hebrew form of that is the same masculine form of a mighty man of valor or a hero. And this letter, once again, was given to an individual or taken by an individual named Elasa, okay, to these exiles. Now, as we move into the next section, and this will be the next five verses, we'll read them in just a little bit. What we'll see here is that Jeremiah wanted these exiles, he wanted to show them or explain to them how they should, behave, how they should be behaving rather in this new pagan society that they found themselves in. And when you think about it, they're under a completely new governance, right? There's, there's a new governance regarding clean and unclean things. And the Jewish people were going to have a difficult time adjusting to this new society. And he wanted them to be good witnesses to the Babylonians. He wanted them to be good representations of the Jewish people. And as we read the next section, I believe that we can relate to these Babylonian exiles in a number of ways. You see, as believers, we're in this world, but we're not of this world, right? People say that all the time. What does that really mean? Well, when you think about it, this is only a temporary place that we've been placed before we go with the Lord forever. So in a sense, we're kind of like exiles in this place right now, although we're not suffering in the ways that these individuals did or other Christians around the world are suffering. Um, however, because we're here temporarily, just like Jeremiah is writing to these exiles there in Babylon, there is a behavioral expectation that has been set before us in the word of God by the Lord while we're here in this foreign place. And I believe knowing that the Lord himself has good plans for us will allow us to continue steadfast in him no matter what we're facing while we're in this place that is foreign to us. And it'll allow us to stay the course as we move forward in the Lord. And this is exactly what Jeremiah desired uh, for these, these exiles. So if you look at verse 4 through 9, what we're going to see here is he's basically telling them, hey, make yourself at home there, but don't compromise. So here it says, beginning in verse 4, it says, The letter stated, This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says to all the exiles I deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for when it thrives, you will thrive. This is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel, says. Don't let your prophets who are among you and your diviners deceive you. And don't let the dreams you elicit from them, for they are prophesying falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them. This is the Lord's declaration. Um, so what we see clearly here through this portion of the text is that these Jewish people were placed there by the Lord himself. That was his will. And in fact, he says here, pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. So the Lord's the one who placed them there in the, the possession of these individuals. And in fact, if you look at Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 9, the Lord speaks of this very thing. He says, I am going to send for all the families of the north, this is the Lord's declaration, and send for my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and I will bring them against this land, against its residents, and against all these surrounding nations. And I will completely destroy them and make them an example of horror and scorn and ruins 
forever. And as we know, the Lord was bringing judgment upon Judah because of their rebellion, because of their sin. And because they were going to be there for quite a while, they were going to be there 70 years. We'll read about that in just a little bit. It was best for them to get comfortable, in a sense, to settle for a while, but yet not compromise. So kind of imagine this for a little bit. You are exiled. You're taken away to a different place. You lose everything. You lose your family. You lose your belongings. You lose everything you liked doing. Your RV, right? You lose all these things that you've, you've acquired, right? And, um, and you, up, you end up in this, in this foreign place. You lose your freedoms. The only thing you have is your life. And when you think about this, this looks to be like a hopeless situation. And what they wanted to do here, what they needed to do was turn this tragedy around and put it into the loving hands of the Lord. You see, God had good plans for them. And he does for us too. And in every difficulty, in every tragedy, in every um, unexplainable that the Lord has brought or continues to bring into our lives, we have to put those things in the loving hands of our God because that is the safest place for those difficulties to be. Because we can't change those things. Only the Lord can, if it's in accordance to his will, of course. And we want to make sure that those things are in his hands. Now, the Lord wanted them to multiply their in Babylon, right? He encourages this. You see, even though they had been exiled, that didn't mean that the Lord had forgotten about them. He still loved them. He was chastening them. And we know, for example, from the author of Hebrews in the 12th chapter, there in the sixth verse, that the Lord disciplines, he chastens, he corrects those whom he loves. And that's exactly what he's doing. And you see, what he wanted is he wanted a population to exist. That way, when they returned from captivity, like there would be people, right? That's exactly what he wanted to see happen. And that's why Jeremiah is writing this to them, that the Lord has given him to write. He expected them to be good members of that society and even bless their Babylonian neighbors. And he wanted submission to their new earthly masters. And it's interesting because if you look at 1 Peter 2, verses 18 through 25. The word of God there speaks of such behavior. And here it's in reference to Christian slaves. Here it says, household slaves, submit to your masters with all reverence, not only to the good and gentle ones, but also to the cruel. For it brings favor if because of a consciousness of God, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you do wrong and are beaten, you endure it. But when you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor with God. For you were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Notice also here that Jeremiah in the latter part of verse seven, he says to them, pray to the Lord on its behalf. They're speaking of this foreign place. For when it thrives, you will thrive. And remember that we as believers have a similar command, right? The word of God tells us to pray for the place where we reside and our leaders. For example, our country, our leaders, right? First Timothy 2 verses 1 through 4 says, First of all, then I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So you may not like the people in power or the people that are in authority, if you will, they're not really. The Lord's in power, right? The Lord's the one on the throne. But those that are our presidents, those that are our leaders, all of these individuals, you may not like them, but the word of God says we need to pray for them because somebody was praying for us when we were in the world, right? 
and we want to pray for everyone else as well. And we pray that the Lord surrounds them with people that will help them make decisions that represent Him and are godly. And that should be what we do every single day. But notice that when we do please the Lord, it allows our enemies to even be at peace with us. And in fact, Proverbs 16, 7 tells us this. When a person's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And kind of thinking about all of these things that we've read so far, a good example of this way of living can be found in the life of Daniel. And um, if you remember, for example, if you look back to that first chapter of Daniel, this kind of gives us a glimpse of um, that Babylonian exile and captivity. If you remember during that time, that King Nebuchadnezzar had ordered that the best and the brightest young men of Jerusalem be brought to Babylon. So Daniel, if you remember, and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, these 13 to 17-year-old young men, they were the best, they were the brightest, they were brought to Babylon. And remember that there, they were to be indoctrinated and they were to be indoctrinated and trained in the ways of that Chaldean culture to turn them away from their Hebrew ways and to turn them away from the Lord and turn them to the ways of that heathen society. And in fact, if you remember, they were ordered to have their names changed, in a sense, giving them a new identity in this new place. And I think a lot of us can relate to this in a way with everything happening in our world today, the indoctrination that's taking place here. And as many of you know, I, I, I teach high school, and a lot of our young people are greatly being indoctrinated right now. And that's an age group that is very concerning. And when you think about it, this is what was happening to these teenagers, in a sense, when they were taken to Babylon. They were being indoctrinated, changing their identity in the Lord to the identity of the world that they found themselves in. But remember that Daniel was different. He was determined not to defile himself with the ways of the society he was living in. And in fact, what he did as, is he um, did not defile himself with the king's food. So instead of eating the food that the king had allotted to them, he preferred to have a vegetarian diet along with his friends. And what he does is he asks permission from the chief eunuch there to allow them to do this. And notice that he does this he asks him, right? He does this in a respectful way. He respected the Babylonians in a sense, right? He didn't protest. He didn't uh, rebel or cause a scene. But after some time, it was 10 days, if you remember, they looked healthier than all the others that were there. And because of their steadfastness, even in the midst of that difficulty, the Lord gave them favor with King Nebuchadnezzar. And in fact, the king found no one equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And what we see here is that Daniel's behavior pleased the Lord and made his enemies, King Nebuchadnezzar, to be at peace with him. And in fact, as you read through the entirety of Daniel, you'll see that he prospers in this foreign land after interpreting some dreams for Nebuchadnezzar and eventually being elevated to high office, all because of his faithfulness and devotion to the Lord. And remember, this was a guy who also prayed a lot devotionally, right? And this was a good example, I think, for not just the young people, but for all of us. And remember that these young men, Daniel and his friends, they made a home there. They didn't compromise, but they remained faithful and their obedience to the Lord continued to strive, knowing their time there would only be temporary. They knew this. You see, I bet these young men knew that God had good plans for them. Even in the midst of that awful time in the history of the Jewish people, just like he's had good plans for the duration of the history of the Jewish people, even what they're facing right now, the Lord has good plans for them. And we have to believe that and continue praying for them and this season they find themselves in. But once again, this is what Jeremiah is commanding these exiles leaders to do, to live lives that are obedient and honoring the Lord, but also respectable towards the Babylonians, being a good example of who they are in this foreign land. And as you and I enter into 2024, there are going to be seasons, once again, where we, we may feel like an exile in this foreign land, filled with distractions and filled with compromise. And the question becomes, what are we going to do? Are we going to become complacent and give in and change our identities to look more like the world? 
Well, no, we need to make this place, once again, our temporary home, right? We don't want to put our, our tent stakes too deep here in this place. And we want to remain steadfast in our obedience and our service unto the Lord, just like we see with Daniel and just like Jeremiah is requesting of these exiles. But notice the last thing that he tells them in this section is to be aware of false prophets. There were these false prophets there amongst the Jews in Babylon. And it is said that these false prophets were giving a false sense of hope. They were telling them that the exile was going to be short-lived. Uh, you know, hey, it's going to be over soon. Um, and what we know is that when we indulge in false hopes, it makes us miss out on what God has planned for us and the blessings that God has planned for us. So we have to be very careful of that. Now, as we move into the, na the last section here, and this is, we're going to camp out here for a little while on this last section, what we're going to see here is that what we have is one of the most, you know, perhaps one of the most beautiful promises that the Lord has for us now and forever. And I think this is something we want to carry with us into this new year of 2024. So if you look at verses 10 through 14, what we see here is a promise of a future and a promise of a hope. So verse 10, it says, For this is what the Lord says, When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. You will call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to this place from which I deported you. So it's interesting because in this section, the Lord renews what has already been declared. For example, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 5, there Moses writes, When all these things happen to you, the blessings and curses I have set before you, and you come to your senses while you are in all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and all your soul by doing everything I am commanding you today, then he will restore your fortunes, have compassion on you, and gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Even if your exiles are at the farthest horizon, he will gather you and bring you back from there. The Lord your God will bring you into the land your ancestors possessed, and you will take possession of it. So as we talked about before, remember there is some false prophets amongst these exiled individuals. And through their dream messages, they were promising a short-lived exile. Um, however, we, we need to understand is that true hope can only come by the revealed word of God. And here, clearly, the word of God declares that this would last 70 years. And then the Lord would bring an end to this exile. So even though they were going to be there for a lengthy stay, the Lord would eventually attend to them and bring them back to their place of, of origin. But notice in verse 11, this is some great encouragement that the Lord has for these individuals. He says, for I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. And I know in some translations, like the New King James, I think it says thoughts, right? It says, I have, yeah, I, uh, for I know the thoughts I have for you. Um, but what you see here is that the Lord knew his plans and his thoughts towards these exiles. After all, he loved them. He wanted the best for them. He was chastening them to bring them back to himself. And perhaps these individuals had forgotten that truth. So that the Lord here is restating um, this truth in this letter. And I want you to think about this for a minute. And first of all, think about how, how much does the Lord think about you? Think about how many times you are on the Lord's mind. And... If you look at Psalm 139, verses 17 through 18, there the word of God says, God, how precious your thoughts are to me. How vast their sum is. 
If I counted them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. And I want you to think about a grain of sand. It's, it's pretty small, isn't it? But think about the grains of sand that cover the entire planet. Um, when you think about that, in fact, there's an estimate. Geoscientists <laughs> estimate that there are about 7.5 sextillion or 75 with 17 zeros behind it, grains of sand on the planet. And when you think about that, the Lord thinks of you and he thinks of me, he thinks of all of us more than the number of grains that are on the face of this planet. And that is amazing. That is just, it's just, he, he's in, I'm in awe of the Lord. But the heartbreaking thing is, and I can say this for a fact, I don't think about the Lord as much as he thinks about me. And I'm so grateful for his the fact that he forgives me for the fallacies in my life. You know, we're all a work in progress, but I hope one of these days I can think of the Lord as much as he thinks of me, you know, 75, six trillion plus times in a day. Now, regarding God's plans, remember what he told Jeremiah regarding his plans for his life. In Jeremiah chapter one, verse five, he tells him, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And just like he knew the plans he had for Jeremiah, even before he had formed him in his mother's womb, he too has known the plan in your life and in my life long before he formed us in our mother's womb. And that's amazing. That's pretty cool, I think. And when you think about this, it's a beautiful reminder this morning to know how much, not only how we are on God's mind, but also the fact that he has laid out plans for us since the beginning, even before we were formed in our mother's womb. Now, if you look in the second part of verse 11, regarding those plans he has for Jeremiah, not for Jeremiah, but for the exiles, also for Jeremiah, for all of us, he says, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And after being exiled for such a long time, you would imagine that these individuals probably were losing sight of God and began to believe that he intended to harm them in the midst of this chastening and had forgotten about them. But it was all part of God's plan for them, and it was a good plan. And when I was thinking about this, it reminded me so much of the life of Joseph. And this is an individual that we talked quite a bit about in our men's group when we were going through the book of Genesis. But just like Daniel, Joseph too prophesied for a foreign land, or he prospered rather in a foreign land, right? He had interpreted dreams for a foreign king or a foreign individual in authority. There it was Pharaoh. And he eventually was elevated to high office, just like Daniel. And it was all because of his faithfulness to the Lord and the fact that like Daniel, he too had the Lord's providence upon him in the midst of that difficult time in his life because he had good plans for him. And as you guys know, Joseph faced some very difficult, difficult times in his life, some awful things, but they were all part of God's plan for him because God's plan for him was to prosper, to have a future, and to have a hope. If you look in that 37th chapter of Genesis, the word of God tells us that Joseph was favored by his father, Jacob. And once again, that was because he had him at such an old age. He was the first son to his beloved wife, Rachel. And as a result of that, his brothers hated him. And in fact, they were so, they, they despised him so much that they plotted to kill him. And they threw him instead into a pit, you know, because his, his eldest brother, Reuben, um, intervened on his behalf. Unfortunately, they added insult to injury by taking him out of that pit and selling him in to slavery for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites. And he was taken to Egypt. But that was in the end for, for Joseph, right? There in Egypt, he was sold once again to a high-ranking Egyptian officer named Potiphar. And he became the supervisor of his household. Unfortunately, Potiphar's wife brought some trouble to Joseph with some unwanted sexual advances and eventually a false rape charge. And this landed him in prison, if you remember. But the Lord used him there too, right? He interpreted some dreams for some of the prisoners and after some time, after two years of that imprisonment, God used him to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, where he predicted seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. 
And as a result, he found favor with Pharaoh and was given the position of second in command. And it was during that famine that the Lord used Joseph to distribute grain, even to those that came as far away as, um, um, as Judah or Canaan. And in fact, this brought his brothers to Egypt. And eventually, after some time, some reuniting between, between him and his brothers. But when their father died and they had buried him, Joseph's brothers were still behaving kind of strangely. They still had some fear. And maybe they were still feeling kind of guilty for what they had done to, um, to Joseph. And in fact, if you look at Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 19, it says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said to one another, If Joseph is holding a grudge against us, he will certainly repay us for all the suffering we caused him. So they sent this message to Joseph. They didn't even tell him in person. They sent it to him. Before he died, your father gave a command. Say this to Joseph. Please forgive your brother's transgression and their sin, the suffering they caused you. Therefore, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when their message came to him. He likely grieved by their continued behavior towards him. His brothers also came to him, bowed down before him. They finally came to him and said, we are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. Therefore, don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So it was very clear here that Joseph knew that even in the midst of those awful things that his brothers had done to him and the awful things that he had gone through over that time, that God had it all planned out for him. It was all part of this big plan for him. And it's interesting because he even indirectly quotes from Romans 8.28, which is something that hadn't even been written yet. Um, but yet he was living that verse. So Paul tells us there in Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And I think this is a beautiful reminder to us this morning, even in the depths of trials, in the pits of life, that God has good plans for us, plans for our well-being, not for a disaster, but to give us a future and to give us a hope, just like he did for Daniel, just like he did for Joseph. And just as he had planned for these exiles, and just as he has planned for all of us in this room this morning, and everyone who will ever believe. And just like Joseph and Daniel, what we need to do is to remain steadfast in the Lord and continue in the work of the Lord. And in fact, if you look at the last section here, what he says in verses 12 through um, 14, it says, You will call to me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to this place from which I deported you. So even though they were in this foreign land, they could still call upon the Lord and he would still listen as, he, as they prayed. You see, in every situation, God's people have the responsibility to seek him in prayer and to ask him to fulfill the promises that we find in his word. And in fact, if you look in the book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 4, the word of God tells us there, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the word of God and prayer will always go together. That is our foundation, and that's something that we need to seek. It is our responsibility, even in the midst of some situations that we don't want to find ourselves in. And that's going to happen in 2024, just like it did in 2023. And notice that their prayers to God, their answers, God's answers to those prayers would be part of their future and part of their hope. And as they searched for him with all their heart, he would not hide from them. And seeking God, once again, was part of their future and part of the hope. And in fact, the purpose of chastening for anybody is to bring people or bring the believer back to the Lord, that he would, they would seek the Lord and ask for forgiveness and draw closer to the Lord. And bringing them back from captivity would be kind of the highlight of their future and their hope at the end of 
that 70 year um, captivity. You see, not only would God bless them and be with them while they were in Babylon, but allow them to come back to their promised land. And this would all be done as they obey him and, and seek him. And thinking about this, it, it kind of reminded me of young King Uzziah. Remember King Uzziah? Um, the word of God tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verses 4 through 5, it says, And he, speaking of King Uzziah, he did, not, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the ways of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And as we know, his godliness was rewarded. He had a long reign of 52 years. And we know that whenever we seek the Lord, that there are going to be great things. There are going to be blessings. And we saw this with King Uzariah, a 16-year-old king when he was called to the throne. You believe that? So whatever God is going to allow us to face in 2024, we have the responsibility to seek him in his word and in prayer, and that will allow us to draw closer to the Lord. And as a result of that, we will have a future and a hope because the Lord has good plans for us. And we saw this once again, just like he had plans for Daniel, for Joseph, and for these exiles, and many, many saints that have gone to be with him before us. The Lord has had good plans for them. And they stuck to the course. They stayed the course, even in the midst of those um, difficult times um, in their lives. So kind of in gathering everything and closing this morning, we learned through this letter that the Lord had written through Jeremiah to the exiles that God had good plans for them. And he has good plans for us. Even in the midst of chasing hardships, illness, the valleys, the highs, and all the in-betweens. And we learn that these good plans can only take place if we continue steadfastly in our obedience and in our faithfulness to continue in the work of the Lord. And as we enter into 2024, just like the exiles, we too in this world are foreigners, right? Not foreigner, like foreigner, but foreigners, right? Um, we know from Philippians 3.20, that our citizenship is actually in heaven. It's not even this place. But while we are here, we must make it our temporary home, blessing those around us, submitting to authority, but yet remaining in the Lord, being good witnesses of the good news. And regardless of what season we are in, we need to continue in the Lord's work. And if that is something that you have yet to do, I want to challenge you this year as we enter into 2024 to give your life to the Lord, to let him use you in ways that he's never used you before. But that has to come from you. That can't come from anybody else. That has to come between you and the Lord. And it's only when we leave those places of comfort and complacency that the Lord can grow us the most. And it's usually when we take those steps of faith to do things that the Lord has put on our heart. And if there are things missing in this church that maybe the Lord has put on your heart, like, oh, we need this, we need that whether it's a ministry, whether it's whatever it is, the Lord's put it on your heart for a reason. And take that step of faith. And if you need your brothers and your sisters to pray for you about it, we will certainly do that because that's where the power begins is in prayer. And we will guide you and help you. So I want to challenge you this year to take those steps of faith, even if it's not in these four walls, outside of these four walls, in your communities, at your places of work, in your school, whatever it is, to build God's kingdom. And as we do this, we need to be grounded in the truths of his promises and the hope in the future that he has for us. Well, how do we do this? Well, we, we have to be responsible to seek him in his word and to seek him in prayer as Jeremiah um, has directed these exiles. And when we do that um, and we search for him with all of our heart, the word of God says that we will find him. And when we do this, it will bring many blessings and allows us to surrender um, to the will of God regardless of what's happening in our lives. And I think a great or the greatest example of this can be found in the life of Jesus Christ himself. In the midst of his earthly ministry, his three-year earthly ministry, the agony and the difficulties that he faced. I remember on the eve of his crucifixion there in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He was in agony, crying out to the Father. But he knew in his heart that his Father had good plans for him. 
So what did he do? He surrendered and said, not my will, but your will be done. And that should be our heart as we go into 2024. Not Isaac's will, but the Lord's will, right? Not your will, but the Lord's will be done. Now, I don't know what season you're carrying with you into 2024. God knows. He knows your hearts better than you know your own hearts. I know for me personally, as many of you know, I've been dealing with a lot of health issues, with my brain tumor, had a brain bleed recently, heart issues. All of those things I know are going to carry over with me into 2024. And the setbacks, the treatments, the doctor appointments, the uncertainties, you know, sickness brings loneliness, guys. It's a difficult time. I know a lot of you know what that's like. All of that's going to carry over into 2024 with me. But I'm grateful for what God has shown me in 2023 through all of those difficult times that he's carried me through and also the blessings I've received from him through him and through you guys as well as he's used you in my life. And I know that as I continue walking with him into 2024, I know he has good plans for me. I can carry this load with me and continue handing it to him as we continue walking together in 2024. Because guys, I want to serve the Lord. I want to live for the Lord. It doesn't matter what's happening in my life. All these things, I truly believe the Lord can use in my life to keep me humble and broken before Him because it's only when you're humble and broken before Him we can use you the most. And that's what I want to do in 2024. You know, Pastor Chuck once said, don't give up what you know to be true because you are facing some things that you don't fully understand. And as you face things in 2024 that maybe you're not going to fully understand until you see the Lord face to face, don't lose sight of the things that you already know that have been revealed through the written word of God and that he has revealed to you by his Holy Spirit. And as we enter into, the, into this new year, I want you to remember what the word of God tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. And this is what we call the believer's triumph. Here it says, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to, the, to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love that. So as we enter into 2024, remember and truly believe that God has good plans for you, for me, and for this church, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. Plans for our well-being, plans for a future, plans for a hope. And knowing these truths, we as his children simply need to surrender to him and allow him to use our lives like he's never used them before. And I really want you to experience God's good plan for your life. And the only way that's possible in 2024 is to surrender your life to him. And I know that's something that's easier said than done. It's a daily battle, but that's something that's doable. We have the victory in Christ Jesus. We just have to choose daily to walk in it. And that's really up to us. So I really want you to truly challenge yourself as we enter into 2024. No more sitting on the sideline as a consumer Christian, but getting into the game and being a Christian that's building God's kingdom. Think about it this way. Not what I can get from God, but what can I give to God from my life? And I can assure you, as we go into 2024 and as we go beyond 2024, the best is still yet to come in Christ Jesus. Amen? So I don't know everyone in here this morning, and I don't know everyone that's watching on the live stream this morning, but if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity um, this morning. And as we went through this study together, I assure you that God has good plans for you too. But the only way you're going to experience those good plans is by allowing him into your life as your Lord and your Savior. 
And if the Lord's been tugging at your heart throughout this year, maybe you face some difficult times, maybe now is the time to just give your life to the Lord. Allow him to come into your life. He's a loving father. He will never leave you nor forsake you like the world does. And he will get you through this next year. If that's you this morning, I want to invite you to just close your eyes, bow your head, and just repeat this uh, with me this morning. Well, Heavenly Father, I want to declare your Son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior this morning. God, I believe that Jesus Christ is your Son. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he was buried. And I believe that he rose from the dead three days later. I believe and I know that I am a sinner, Lord. I pray that you forgive me for my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me from the inside out. And use me for your glory as we enter into 2024. I pray these things, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. I can assure you, as the Gospel of Luke tells us in the 15th chapter, that even when one sinner repents, the angels are celebrating in heaven on your behalf. If you want more information about our church, maybe your next steps, maybe you need a Bible, maybe you need prayer, you just need to get connected somewhere, uh, please reach out to us or you can come visit us. Um, you can come to our first service of, of 2024 on January 8th here at the church at 10 a.m. We are located at the intersection of Gateway South and Hondo Pass. And um, if you want more information, please let us know. We'll continue to pray for you. Um, we love you and we hope to see you in, um, in 2024. So bye for now.